Today we will continue where we left off yesterday. That is <clears throat> speaking about the life which is compared to a computer. <clears throat> In a computer, there are a number of mechanisms or systems of mechanisms necessary for it to operate. In the same way, in this body, there are a number of mechanisms and systems of Dhamma which allow it to operate. <clears throat> in this computer life, there are the the matters or realities of the five khandas, the five heaps of existence or of human existence. Then there are the four adhyasacca, the four noble truths. And then there is paticca samupata, that is dependent origination. And finally, the matter or subject of anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing in and out. Within this computer life, we can find all four of these subjects or areas to explore. The five aggregates or heaps, the noble truths, the reality or law of dependent origination and mindfulness with breathing. <clears throat> so in this computer of ours, there are the, there's the system of the five khandas. This is the body and mind, the basic hardware of our computer, the body and mind. And then there are the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths are like our disk operating system. This Four Noble Truths are specifically the understanding of how dukkha occurs and of how dukkha is quenched. And then there is the dependent origination, which goes into the arising and ending of dukkha in great detail. Then finally there is anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing, which is the practice through which we learn how to keep the entire system operating without any dukkha, without any problems. We'll begin by talking about the five khandas because this is the basic hardware of our computer. When we speak in this way, we, we distinguish life, we distinguish the mind-body into five areas or five sections. In each of these sections is called a khanda. When we speak of the five khandas, we can break them up into two categories. The first category has to do with the body. It's the physical category. And then the second category are the mental or the, the psychic. So all of the five khandas can be broken into two categories. The first category has one, one khanda and the remaining four khandas fall under the mental category. The first category 
is made up of a single khanda, that which is called rupa khanda, which means the body. But if we study it in more detail, we'll see that this one khanda of the body is made up of four dhatus or four natural elements. The earth element, water element, fire element, and wind element. <clears throat> the, by the earth element, we mean that which takes up space, the property of solidity which takes up space. The water element is the property that holds things together. It's the property of cohesion, the liquidness that connects and holds things together, that is cohesion. Regarding the water, water element, we can see easily that if you, if you take something and split water, it always comes back together and fills up the space. In this way we can see the quality of cohesion in water. The fire element is the element of temperature. It has the property of combustion, of burning up things, of consuming things. The wind element has the property of movement. For example, all gases, in all gases you can see the property of movement. That property which causes the gases to move is what we mean by the wind element. But all four of these elements work together to make up one khanda, the rupa khanda, or the body. The second category of the khandas begins with the vetana khanda, or feeling. The second mental, mental khanda is the activity of recognizing or perceiving the feeling or that which is felt. Once something is felt, then we recognize what it is and evaluate it and then regard it as being this or that. This is called sanya khanda. Then once something has been recognized, this causes thinking. The thinking about what is felt and recognized is called Sankara Khanda, which simply means thinking. Then we come to the last of the mental khandas, Vijnana Khanda, or the, the aggregate of consciousness. This is that which knows or cognizes things. In fact, it ought to be the first of the mental khandas because it arises before the other one. But because it functions so often, it functions in regard to all of the khandas. And so it is in the traditional list, it comes last. But actually it should be the first of the four mental khandas. So altogether there are five khandas, or sections of life. The physical category is made up of one khanda, rupa khanda, which literally means the form aggregate, but it simply means the body. And then there are the four mental khandas, or sections. There is Vetana Khanda, the feeling section, and then Sanya Khanda, the recognition section, 
Sankara Khanda, the thinking section, and Vijnana Khanda, the consciousness section. Altogether, these five Khandas make up a living being, a living human being. We ought to know these things within ourselves in terms of being one person. We ought to know ourselves that in this one person there are these five khandas, that this person or individual whom we are is composed of these five khandas and nothing more. We've never considered ourselves in this way before. We've never looked at ourselves in terms of these five khandas because we've never been taught about it. Not having been had it, not having had it explained to us, we don't see its importance and so we don't give it any attention. But in fact, it's something very important, something that requires our most careful attention and interest. Once we know these five khandas, we see that these five khandas are the foundation for the arising and quenching, the arising and quenching of all other dhammas. All things, all natural events occur and end with these five khandas as their basis or foundation. Next we come to the second subject, that of the four noble truths. This is the subject of the things that happen with the five khandas as their basis. Once we have the five khandas, then the four noble truths occur or become relevant. If we want, we can summarize these noble truths into just two. There is dukkha, that's one, and there's the ending of dukkha, that's two. But because the subject of dukkha has two aspects, namely dukkha itself and the cause of dukkha, and because the ending of dukkha has two aspects, the quenching of dukkha and the way of practice that quenches dukkha or that leads to the quenching of dukkha. For this reason, we speak of the Four Noble Truths. The first Noble Truth is the truth about Dukkha. Dukkha is everything undesirable, unpleasant, and unsatisfying which happens to this body or and within this body. All the things that we don't want to happen, all the things which are unsatisfying or these are what we mean by dukkha. This is the noble truth of dukkha or dukkha ariyasacca. All forms of dukkha, all forms of pain and dissatisfaction are included within the feeling aggregate or Vedana Khanda. All forms of dukkha are just certain kinds of feeling. <clears throat> Next is the cause or origin of dukkha, the Samutaya Ariyasatja, which is nothing other than desire the desire which causes, or which leads to attachment, to clinging to things as me and mine, 
the desire which itself comes from feeling. Because there are feelings, then there arise various desires towards those feelings, because of those feelings. This desire is the cause or origin of dukkha. If we wish to classify it according to the five khandas, then it is sankara khanda. Desire is a kind of thinking. Next we come to the third noble truth, the, the noble truth of the quenching of dukkha. This is called nirota, which means not just a temporary cessation, but a thorough, utter quenching of dukkha, where dukkha is gone for good. This is the third noble truth. Now this thing, nirota, or utter quenching, is something difficult to understand. If we look at it in terms of our experience, then we would say that nirota or quenching is a kind of feeling. Because nirota is the quenching of all dukkha, we can call that a certain special kind of happiness. And this happiness the special happiness of nirota then must be considered a kind of feeling. But if we look at it more broadly and deeply, we see that nirota is just another name for nibbana. If we look at it more from the side of reality than the side of our experience, then we see it in terms of Nibbana. And Nibbana is not included within the five khandas. So if we look at it on this higher level, Nirota is a matter of Nibbana. It's a matter of the, of the Asankata, of the unconcocted or unconditioned, the unchanging, timeless reality. So if we look at it in this way, then the third noble truth of nirota, of utter quenching, does not fall within the five khandas. But if we look at it in terms of our own experience, that this reality of quenching can be experienced or felt by us, then we would speak of it as Vedanakanta. The fourth noble truth is the Magha Sacha, the truth of the path or way. This is the noble truth of the path that leads to the quenching of dukkha. This is something we must understand carefully. The path is not the quenching of dukkha. The quenching of dukkha itself is the third noble truth. But the fourth noble truth is the path, the way, the methodology that brings us to the realization of the quenching of dukkha. The truth of the path is the, is the way of living, the correct way of living that leads to the realization of the final quenching of dukkha. In order for dukkha to be quenched, then the path is simply a way of living, the correct way of living that doesn't allow dukkha to happen. If we can keep dukkha from arising, then eventually all dukkha will be quenched. This way of living that prevents the arising of dukkha is what we mean by the path. 
we can illustrate this point with the simple example of a fire. Which is easier and better to prevent the fires from happening or to put them out once they have started? If we let the fire happen, then we have to get involved with the fire and have to put it out. And in the process, we can get burnt. But if we prevent the fire from happening in the first place, then there's no need to mess around with the fire itself. This way is much safer and cleaner. It's the same way with dukkha. If we let dukkha happen, then we have to suffer through it until it can be ended. But if we prevent all dukkha, then we don't have to mess around with it at all. So this makes up the fourth noble truth, the noble truth of the path that leads to the quenching of dukkha. Altogether, these four noble truths, dukkha, the origin of dukkha, the quenching of dukkha, and the path that leads to the quenching of dukkha, these are the four things make up our second subject, the four noble truths. Our thoughts and reflections regarding the quenching of dukkha can be included within the fourth khanda, the third mental khanda or sankara khanda, the thinking section or, or aspect of life. All of our thoughts and reflections on the Four Noble Truths would fit, be categorized as thinking or sankara khanda. But one should recognize that this is a different kind of thinking than the ordinary concocting of our minds. This kind of thinking is going in the opposite direction, whereas most of our thinking is defiled and egoistic. Thinking in terms of the quenching of dukkha <coughs> cuts through that, goes against the stream of all that. It leads towards the ending of concocting. So finally, one can see that the truth of dukkha is Vedana Khanda, the feeling section. And then the origin of dukkha is Sankara Khanda, the thinking section. And then the noble truth of the quenching of dukkha. This is once again the feeling section. And then the path that leads to the quenching of dukkha is the Sankara Khanda or thinking section again. So there's feeling section and thinking section, feeling section and thinking section. This is how the Four Noble Truths are based upon our computer. This is how they, are, they interact with our computer. One can close one's eyes and observe for oneself that the Four Noble Truths are within the five khandas. The, we can see, experience, and understand these Four Noble Truths only within the five khandas. There's no other place to find them. So now we've covered two subjects, the five khandas and the Four Noble Truths. The next subject goes into the arising of dukkha in great detail. This is the way to really understand how dukkha happens. So next we'll discuss the but teaches samupada or dependent origination. The meaning of paticca samupada is quite simple. It just means that depending on this, this happens. 
depending on these things, this happens. So happening, originating, dependent on other things, relying on other things, is the simple meaning of dependent origination. This happens depending on things, and then th and then next this happens depending on things, and then this happens depending on causes and conditions. This constant flowing of things arising due to causes and conditions, things constantly arising one after the other, depending on causes and conditions, is what is meant by Paticca Samupata, or dependent origination. To study dependent origination, we begin once again with Rupakanda, or the body section of life. When we speak of the body here, we mean specifically the senses, the media for communication with the world, namely the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, which are collectively called the ayatana, the communicators, the media for communicating with the world. There are these six inner communicators, and they communicate or make contact with things outside, material things, the forms which are seen by the eyes, sounds heard by the ears, smells, flavors, physical sensations, and mental objects or experiences. These later six are called the outer ayatana, or external communicators. Without the external communicators, then the, the inner ones don't operate or function. But when these six sets or pairs come into, when they make contact or when they interact, then there is Rupa Kanda. This is where our study of dependent origination begins. <clears throat> now when the inner communicators meet with the outer communicators, this activity of meeting is called Baticca. The word paticca in paticca samupata simply means to come together or to interact, although in Thai it's preferred, it's generally translated as asaigan or dependent or dependently, but literally it means tungan kao, which we can say is to come together or interact. So when the eyes meet with forms, this interacting, this paticca, leads to the arising of something new, namely consciousness. If it's dependent on having to do with the eyes, we call it eye consciousness. When it's regarding the ears, we call it ear consciousness. Then there is nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, and mind consciousness. So depending on the six pairs of communicators, when these six pairs interact or when they baticca, then there arise the six kinds of sense consciousness or vijnana. <coughs> So just, just here with the interacting of the inner and outer communicators, we already have paticca. And then with the arising of consciousness, depending on the, the senses, for example, eye and form, or ear and sound, just that is dependent origination. We have the activity or the 
the reality of dependent origination right there. And so now we have three things. We have the inner communicators, the outer communicators, and then sense consciousness. There are these three things. And then depending on these three things, there is another mode or level of dependent origination. Depending on these three things, as these three meet together, then there arises patsa, patsa or contact. Patsa or contact is when the experience makes an impression on us. And then depending on this contact or this sense impression, there arises feeling. Please observe until you see for yourself how feeling arises due to contact. Next, relying upon this feeling, there arises desire or dhanha. This desire happens depending on the value of the feeling. Whether it's a positive, the feeling has a positive or negative value, then various kinds of desire will arise. Wanting and desiring according to that value of the feeling. <clears throat> if the feeling is ignorant, if there is no wisdom or intelligence regarding the feeling, then the desires or wants that arise due to that feeling will also be ignorant and lacking in intelligence. However, if the feeling is experienced with wisdom, if there's wisdom uh, managing things, then the desire that arises due to that feeling is different. And so we no longer call it danha or desire. Instead, we call it sankapa or aspiration. To aspire in a wise way is much different than to want in the typical blind and foolish way, which is called danha. So it's very important first to understand that due to feeling, desire arises, but also to see the difference between the foolish desire that arises when there is no wisdom regarding the feeling and the wise want or aspiration that occurs when there is wisdom at feeling. Right here is the fork in the road. This is our big moment of decision. One fork leads to dukkha. There is the fork of avicca, of not knowing, of non-intelligence, of ignorance. If we take this fork, then it leads from ignorant feeling to ignorant desire to attachments and to dukkha. That's the fork of ignorance. But the other way, the other path, is the fork of vicca of right understanding, of panya, of wisdom. If we take this fork, then from wise feeling, it leads to wise aspiration. And this path doesn't stir up dukkha. This is the fork that leads to the quenching of dukkha. So one ought to get to know this this fork in the road between going on heedlessly, ignorantly, stupidly towards dukkha or to carry on wisely, 
towards the quenching of dukkha. If we understand this fork in the road well, if we really understand it with wisdom, then we will be able to take the most beneficial choice to follow the way towards the quenching of dukkha. Unfortunately, people in this world, and that means all of us, lack the wisdom and understanding to follow the wise path. Lacking that wisdom, we, we just can't help it, that there is ignorant feeling, there are stupid desires, this gets us into the foolishness of attachment, and so there is dukkha. If we foolishly let desire happen, then the desire grows, it intensifies, and as in desire gets stronger, it leads to the arising of attachment. Attachment happens because of this foolish desire. Attachment is even more foolishness. It's even greater stupidity. It's when, because of the intensity of the desire, the mind assumes blindly that there must be the one who desires. Because there's this twisted energy of desire, ignorance assumes that there must be someone who is the desire or owns it or controls it. And so this leads to attachment to the desirer. From the ignorant desire there arises stupid attachment or upadana. Once this attachment has arisen, this is the beginning of ego. Once there is attachment, the ego, the me, the self, has begun. But it's not yet complete, it's not yet fully mature or ripened. At the level of attachment, this could be compared with the conception of a human embryo. When the, when the sperm fertilizes the egg and there is conception of human life, this is comparable to attachment. And then depending on this attachment, there arises pawa, pawa or existence. So far, it hasn't existed completely. But now, now there is complete or full existence. This is what is called pawa. If one wants to ask, how does this me, this ego, happen? How does it establish itself? Then we answer right here, in the arising of bhava, or pawa, dependent on attachment. Through this attachment, and then there arises this, this ignorant existence. That's how this me, this ego, sets itself up. When the sperm fertilizes the egg, then there is conception. And then this embryo grows and develops. This, and then eventually the, the embryo grows into a fetus, which develops further, and once it is mature, it is born as a new human life. This is a physical example. What we call attachment is comparable to the conception, and then the growth and development of the embryo and fetus is the same as existence. In the way the human life begins to exist, once the embryo grows and matures. In the same way, ego 
starts to exist. This me exists with a lot. And then this, as this ego develops and ripens, it becomes mature enough to be born. And this birth is called jati, jati, which simply means birth. In this case, the birth of the ego, the fully mature and ripened me. Once there is this birth, then the thing that we're calling ego or self or the selfish ego, it's not so much what you call it, but seeing the, the reality of it. This, but at, with this jati, this, this ego or self or selfish ego is born. And once it's born, it grabs onto everything as being me or being mine. Once there's the ego, then everything is grasped and clung to, is claimed to be me and mine. So for example, joy and sadness, pleasure and pain, um, birth, aging, getting old, illness and death. These are all taken sometimes as being me, other times as being mine. And what's most stupid of all, this, this ignorant activity will go and take the five khandas, the five sections of life, as being me, as being mine. And so when due to birth, ego lays claim to things as being me and mine, through this there is dukkha. This is how dukkha arises, because through birth things are grasped and clung to fully, tightly, completely as being me and mine. And so the only thing that can happen is that there will be dukkha, there will be pain. So this is how, this is the final, the final mode or link in the dependent origination of dukkha, how depending on birth there is dukkha. This birth of ego is happening all the time, each day of our lives. Over and over again, moment after moment, minute after minute, day after day, for our entire lives, this birth of ego, of the selfish me, keeps happening over and over again. But we don't recognize it. We don't see it. We think that nothing's happening because we don't see and understand dependent origination. So we don't see this ego being born over and over again. But it's going on all the time. <clears throat> Sometimes it's dependent on the eyes. Sometimes on the ears. Sometimes the nose, the tongue, the body, or the mind. But over and over again, this ego, this me, this selfish self, is, keeps getting born. And when we don't know these things that are happening within us over and over again, almost constantly, then how stupid are we? How, to what degree are we stupid when we don't even know that which is happening within us? Please consider this question. So whatever kind of experience it is, whatever kind of object, whether making contact through the eyes, the ears, or whatever, whether it's positive or negative, it just leads to trouble. If it's a positive object, then there's positive experience, positive desire, positive attachment, 
positive ego. If it's a negative object, then a negative experience, negative attachment, negative ego. But if there's ego, whether it's positive or negative, it's heavy. All forms of ego, no matter how positive or good, are burdensome. So it doesn't matter what kind of contact, if it's positive or negative, then there's this burdenness, this burdensomeness, this heaviness of the ego. This dukkha of carrying this weight of ego then makes us suffer. If, if it's positive, then we like it, it delights us, it makes us happy and glad. And so we're tormented by gladness. This gladness is a, this happiness is a positive kind of torment. If it's a negative experience, then we don't like it, <clears throat> we hate it. And so we're tormented in a negative way. Whether if we let things become positive or negative, then it's a torment nonetheless, or without exception. Both positive and negative experiences are a torment. Please try to understand this. Otherwise, you'll be deceived by the positive. You'll be, you'll fall in love with the positive and then it will keep tormenting you forever and ever. If it's positive, then we hug it, we cuddle it, we caress it. The positive is the kind of dukkha that we are most willing to endure. It's the kind of pain that we volunteer for most readily. And so we fall into it get totally addicted to it <clears throat> until our whole lives are dominated by our obsession with pos the positive in spite of all the dukkha and trouble it causes. If we need to be glad and happy all day long, if we need to be laughing all the time, then we won't be able to eat, we won't be able to swallow our food. If we're sad and sorrowful all the time, if we're crying all day long, then we still won't be able to swallow our food. Whether this laughing all the time or crying all the time, it's abnormal. It's kind of torment. Although in its, in its external condition, these two, or in their externals, these two are opposites, but in their effect upon us, they are the same, in that they torment us, they burden us. But if we are above and beyond all that positive and negative so that it can't cause us any trouble. That is the meaning of salvation. The true meaning of salvation is to be above and beyond the power of all positive and all negative so that none of it can affect us or concoct us. When things are like that, then there must be one more system within our computer, or within our computer life, that will regulate, that will manage and oversee this stream of dependent origination. This stream of dependent origination is going on all the time. We need some system to manage it, to deal with it. 
this system will create and develop sati or mindfulness the mind that can recollect the present reality all the time it will create and develop panya wisdom correct understanding of things as they really are it will develop sampachanya the immediate and specific application of wisdom of understanding to whatever is going on right now and it will develop samati the mind which is well established firm and focused for this reason we practice the system of mindfulness with breathing in order to develop this mindfulness wisdom ready application of wisdom and samadhi in order to control and regulate the stream of dependent origination so one ought to be very interested in this practice called anapanasati because through practicing mindfulness with with excuse me mindfulness with breathing in and out then we can develop all four of these necessary things so far we don't have any means to control the stream of dependent origination so the ego and dukkha keeps getting concocted over and over again but through anapanasati we can we can develop within our within our minds the necessary mindfulness wisdom specific application of wisdom and concentration needed for controlling the stream of dependent origination so please be very interested in this and apply yourself to its practice at a minimum it's a very excellent kind of psychology at a minimum it will bring us good mental health and if we really develop it it will take us much further so please be most interested in this practice now for those of you who are practicing and training in this way let us explain that there are four kinds of victory of victoriousness included in this way of practice there is the victory over the body the victory over the feelings there is victory over the mind and victory over all the things which will trick us into attachment through the system called mindfulness with breathing in and out there are these four kinds of victory so the first victory is over the body in this we improve and adjust our bodies until they're correct and so that there's no more problems regarding regarding these bodies and so on one level the body is strong and vigorous it has a strength efficiency and ability required for further practice and second this body is calm it's very calm and quiet so there's a kind of peacefulness and a happiness a joy which comes from gaining this victory over the body next is the victory over the feelings the feelings or the vedana which by the way are not emotions but these feelings these vedana have the power to pull the mind in all the different directions 
positive feelings pull the mind one way, negative feelings the other, and then feelings which are kind of in the middle pull the mind in another way. These feelings have great power to pull and lead the mind. And so they, they're the basis for everything that happens in our lives and in this world. These feelings have such power over us that we become their slaves. But through understand, investigating, understanding, and then getting control over these feelings, we achieve a great victory. This victory over the feelings is what comes through the second part of mindfulness with breathing, what is called Vaitanu Bhatsana, or contemplation of the feelings. Because we are slaves to these feelings, we end up doing all kinds of things in order to get them, especially the positive ones. And so we create all kinds of things to satis to create these feelings that we desire. And so nowadays we have all kinds of things which amount to needless, unnecessary luxuries. This is what we've got in this so-called developed modern world. In this modern world, it's full up of things that bring us the kind of feelings we like. But we don't observe this, we don't pay any attention to it. We're just very proud of our developments, our technology, of our modernity. But what it comes down to, or take a good look and see if it doesn't just come down to a lot of excess, a lot of unnecessary stuff just created for the sake of the feelings. And then when we've created all this technology, all these, and all this industry to serve the feelings, then we have to have, we have to abuse art and psychology to create advertising and marketing. We have to come up with these ways to trick people to buy stuff they don't even need. And this is just another way to stir up the feelings. And then in this world of, of technology, of luxury, of advertising, of competition, then we find ourselves competing and struggling with each other to get the feelings. We find ourselves fighting amongst friends, in our families, and even between nations. So in the end we go to war because of these feelings, because of our slavery, because of our infatuation to these feelings. We create all the kinds of problems that exist in this world, world <clears throat> including war. So one ought to examine this situation that we and all of humanity is in. See the very harmful results that come from our slavery to the feelings. And then you will get, you will develop a genuine interest in getting free of these, this power of the feelings, in, become, in raising ourselves above and beyond the influence of the feeling. Please examine these things until you have a sincere desire to get free of the power of the feeling. So we need to study a lot to the degree that we go to university and even get post postdoctorate or and then get graduate degrees. And then we need to work, 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 work. And then we get all kinds of money and we store our money and invest our money and save our money. And then we travel and travel and travel. And all of this is just to, to find and sustain the feelings. All this study, 
work, saving, and travel. It's just searching for, trying to get and maintain these feelings. So one, one can see the problem created by the feelings, this burden of our infatuation and slavery to the feelings, that we have to do all this studying and all this working and all this saving and all this traveling because we're a slave to these feelings. We're not afraid to be slaves of the feelings. We're not even embarrassed that we're such, such, in such a thraldom, that we're such slaves. We don't ever think of going against the feelings, of fighting against them, of getting ourselves free, of overcoming them. And so we just go on and on in our slavery spending our entire lives as slaves to the feeling without ever once thinking of getting free. We think we're already free, how little we understand. And so we're still slaves to the feelings, and so the feelings lead us by our noses around the world. We go around and around the world, how many times, and we still don't find an end to it all. No matter how many times we go around the world or where we go, we never come an end to this slavery, to this power of the feeling. So it just goes on and on endlessly, this slavery. We'll be able to be masters, the bosses of the feelings, when we can have mastery over the mind. So therefore we must learn how to control the mind so that we can be masters of the feelings. So we, we make the mind satisfied with, by doing things that are correct. We train the mind to be satisfied with actions and activities which are correct. And then we control the mind by concentrating it in various ways to different levels, to different degrees. And then we make the mind release. We make the mind let go. We train the mind to release everything so that it's not clinging or hanging on to anything. So in these different ways we learn to control the mind. We gain mastery over the mind by making it satisfied with correctness, by concentrating it in better and better ways, by making it release and let go. This brings us to the last stage of practicing anapanasati, which is called dhammanupatsana, the contemplation of dhamma. Here dhamma means all things, it means all of nature. But to talk of contemplating all of nature is far too broad, it was, would take us forever. So what we mean here is, amongst all things, those particular things which are the basis of attachment, the things that have tricked us into attaching to them. These are the dhammas that we contemplate in this last tetrad or stage of anapanasati. <clears throat> so we contemplate these dhammas until we see them as they really are, until we can let go of them so that they are no longer able to trick us into attachment. When we say dhamma or things, the things we are most attached to are our homes, our possessions, our husbands and wives, our lovers, our children, 
our status, our reputations, up to and including our own lives. These are the things we are attached to. We need to look at them carefully, deeply, until we can let go of them, until we see that none of these things are worth attaching to as being me or mine. And then when we can let go of all these things, then we are free. When we're free of these things, then we are able to relate to them. We can still have homes and possessions, we'll have a reputation, a family, and we can still live. But we, our relationship, our interaction with all these things is no longer one of attachment. It's one of freedom, of non-attachment. And so everything is fine. Everything is just okay. Instead of everything being a burden, a problem, a hassle, a struggle, everything is fine because we no longer deal with things through attachment. It's not necessary that we burn down our homes. We don't have to drive our cars into the ocean. We don't have to divorce our, or kill our husbands and wives. All we need to do is to stop attaching to these things. Instead of living with them through attachment, we can live with them through mindfulness and wisdom. When we are mindful and wise, then we no longer attach. And so none of these things are a problem. When we're not attached to these things, then they serve us. But when we attach to them, we serve them. It's like we've got all these things piled on top of our heads. And our heads are burdened, our brains, our minds are burdened by all these things that we must serve. But by letting go of them, we don't have to serve any of them and then we can make the most of them. We can use them in truly beneficial ways. So we ought to make this computer, computer life of ours free of attachment by practicing mindfulness with breathing and achieving these four victories over body, feelings, mind, and all the dhammas we attach to, then we can have our computer won't be fouled up with any attachment. And then this life will be complete. It will be free. So now we know about and understand the five khandhas, the four noble truths, the entire sequence of dependent origination and the practice of anapanasati in its fullness in all four areas. With this knowledge, then our life computers can run most efficiently without any glitches and follow-ups. And so this life is free of problems. And we have realized the purpose of, of life. Some of you might be thinking that this living computer is, is magical, that it's even more than magic. But we'd like to say that in fact, there's nothing magical or strange about it. <coughs> it's totally natural that everything we've been talking about is just natural. And so please don't think that it's difficult. Instead, just study nature, 
the law of nature, the duty according to law of nature, and the results of doing that duty correctly according to the law of nature. If you study these meanings of nature, of Dhamma, then it will be simple, will be easy for you to make this living computer function superbly without any problem. And so time is up. In closing, we wish you all success in studying Dhamma, in practicing Dhamma, in having Dhamma, and in using Dhamma, in applying Dhamma so that your lives are free of all problems and trouble. We use, wish you complete success in this. And so please walk back to the meditation center without a walker. Just walk naturally without the added burden of the walker. Let the living computer function on its own correctly according to its natural mechanisms. Don't drag this silly illusion of a walker along with you. And so can we allow us to end today's talk and close the meeting for today.